Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our coming together once again today. We thank you, Lord, for the congregation of the righteous. We thank you for such an assembly like this where we love the word of God. Where we love to hear what God will say unto us. Lord, we thank you because you've made us a congregation, not a congregation of hypocrites. A congregation of insincere people. A congregation of nominal Christians that do not really want to do the word of God. You've made us a congregation of righteous people. Those who are eager, asking all the time, O oh Lord, what will you have us to do? Father, we pray, such grace you have given us, such interest and love for your word you have given us, will never leave us even until we see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we come together today and we pray, O oh Lord, that you will enrich our lives with your word in Jesus' name. We pray that this word will bring light across our pathway. That this word will be like a sword that will patch us and evil things in Jesus' name. That this word like fire will burn every chaff, every useless thing away from our lives in Jesus' name. We pray that this word will even develop faith in us so that we'll have a close, intimate fellowship, relationship, working with the Lord in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that your name will be glorified in our lives. How we pray that as a result of studying the word and complying with what is studied will indeed be the light of the world and the salt in the earth that we live. Father, help us that this word will so enrich our lives, that this word will be upheld in our lives and also will have a good scriptural holy influence upon other people too. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, we come together again to study the Word of God. And we bless the name of the Lord because as we study the Word of God, the challenge that is always before us is that God will help us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. For some of us, it's a real great sacrifice to be here. It's a sacrifice in the sense that you are to leave some other things. But it is the evidence of your love. The evidence of your wanting to seek after the Lord. And I want to assure you that anyone that will seek for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all other things that you have to put aside, all other things will be added unto you. And would you also be an encouragement to other people that they will know that the Christian life is a kind of life that demands self-denial. A kind of life that will make us to deny ourselves of the use of our time for ourselves and encourage them, influence them, prevail upon them to come together with us to study the word of God. Because great will be the peace and great will be the inheritance of the people that give themselves to the study of the word of God. Today in our study we come to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. You see, the word we come to study today, these words, they are great, great words. Reaching unto us and giving unto us from the heart of our heavenly Father. In fact, we must rejoice like Jesus Christ when he said, he rejoiced because his disciples were hearing what they were hearing. And they were seeing what they were seeing. And then Jesus said, there have been kings and prudent men and people of the earth that wanted to see those things and they were not able to see them. He turned to his own disciples and he said, blessed are your eyes, blessed are your ears for what you hear, for what you see. And so can we say as we look deeply into the chapter before us that really indeed blessed are our eyes and blessed are our ears. Because there have been people that have gone to seminary, theological training, and they've gone to colleges, they've studied ancient languages and modern languages. They've studied a lot of things, theology and hermeneutics. And yet the simple truths of the word of God, they do not know, but God has revealed them unto us who are babes in the Lord. Now let's look at some of the verses so that you'll get a sampling of what we're looking at today in Exodus chapter 22, in verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Look at the latter part of verse 3. 
for he should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for a theft. Look at verse 5. If a man shall cause a field of vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed in another man's field, of the best of his own field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. Verse 6. If fire break out and catch in turns, so that the stacks of corn, or the standing corn, or the field, be consumed therewith, he that kindled the fire, shall surely make restitution the first part of verse 10 connected with verse 12 if a man uh, this if a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep look at verse 12 and if it be stolen from him he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof in verse 14 and if a man borrow out of his neighbor and if it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. Go on to the very last verse, verse 31. And ye shall be holy men unto me. Ye shall be holy men unto me. In that last verse, you have the intention of God, the desire of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the reason for giving us all the word he has given us. The conclusion is this, ye shall be holy men unto me. Anything you, have, you read from verse 1 to verse 30, and you wonder, why is it like that? Why are we to act like that? Why are we to do what the Lord is saying? He says the reason I've given you all those verses going on from verse 1 through to verse 30 is so that you will be holy men, holy people unto me. And you see what we're dealing with today already from the sampling of the verses I've read to you. You will see that the chapter is talking about repentance, restitution, righteousness. Three weighty practical words. Repentance, restitution, and righteousness. Now, if you look around you, you will see that these days are characterized by a sad departure from the truth. Let that not surprise you. We have been told that the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. And these are those perilous days that the Holy Spirit expressly spoke about. There are those who once believed and preached the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, but who now have departed from that faith. In fact, the prediction that a time of falling away will come, that prediction is coming true today. That falling away is taking place at an alarming rate. If you look at evangelical churches, gospel churches, Pentecostal churches, the people that believe the word of God before, and they preach the word of God in its sincerity, in its absolute entirety, in past months or past years, you may discover that a falling away has happened already. That what they were emphasizing then, they cannot emphasize, they will not emphasize today. Instead of speaking the things which become sound doctrine, Titus chapter 2 verse 1, many are being carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. In fact, many people who call themselves preachers together with the church goers and religious people, they turn away their ears from the truth and they are turned unto fables. This is what John the Beloved saw and he said, little children, you know that it is the last time. And we know this as you see the Antichrist and the false teachers and the false prophets and the people that are diluting the word of God, the people that are mutilating, destroying the word of God, twisting, distorting the word of God. You know of a surety that these are the very last days. Satan always fights against important truths which are necessary for our eternal happiness. So, he fights against the scriptural teaching of repentance, restitution, and righteousness. His purpose is to drag souls to hellfire for eternal suffering. Though Satan and false teachers and prophets... And liars, let us remember that God is always keeping to the truth. Because God is truth. In him is no lie, is no error, is no falsehood at all. And his word remains ever true. God will not change and his word does not change. What does the Bible say? Open your Bible and find out in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. You see that? You will not add to it. Your education does not make you to know more than God. Do not say, because of my education, don't add to the word of God. 
and do not say because I am an illiterate, I am going to take away from the word of God. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Aught from it. I want you, if you understand English very well, I want you to understand this word aught. If you put an N, an N near that aught, it, it becomes not or nothing. Which means what we call an aught in scripture is something so small, something so minute, it is even next to nothing. It says you will not diminish an ought. You will not diminish any little thing, any jot, any little, any title from the word of God. That ye may keep it. That is, you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. In Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32. It says, what thing soever. Whatever it is. What thing soever. It is small, it is big, it is hard, it is simple. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Don't push it aside. Don't give an excuse. Don't uh, minimize it. Don't water it down. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. What are we told in Proverbs chapter 30? The first uh, part of verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. You see the word you are going to listen to today, and the word you have been listening to, every time you come in here, we read the word of God together. It gives us assurance. It says, don't tamper with it. Don't change it. Don't remove anything from it. Every word of God is pure. And then if you'll keep that word, it tells us in that verse 5, He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Then in verse 6, Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee. If you add anything to the word of God, He will reprove you eternally. He will rebuke you, chastise you, punish you eternally. And then you'll be found a liar. Do you know the lot of liars? Uh, that's in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. If you are found a liar in the sight of God, you'll not be able to stay with him eternally. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 22 verses 18 and, ni and 19. Very important words. And these are words of warning. Uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, telling us at the very last chapter, the conclusion of the whole Bible. It says in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man, any man, any man shall add unto these things, wait there for a moment, any man, you see, none of us will be so popular. None of us will be so authoritative. None of us will be so intelligent and then think that we have the liberty to add anything to the word of God. There are some people that uh, they do not fear God. And they do not understand the fair indignation and judgment of God. And they will tell you that they have been to seminary. They will tell you that they have studied original languages, ancient languages. They will tell you that uh, they have gone so far. Or they will tell you that they are so rich, they are so educated, therefore they cannot just stay with the word of God like that. And they will add to the word of God. Look at that. It says, if any man, whoever you are, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues, the suffering, the punishment, the chastisement, the judgments that are written in this book. In verse 19, and if any man, that's it again, if any man, any man, whatever the position in the church, any man or any woman, that word man is used in a generic sense for everyone, if any man shall take away, shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Let me ask you a question. How do you take away from the word? Well, you do that in various ways. You can deny it openly. You are taking away. Or you can keep silent about it. Just don't mention it. There are people that will never mention the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. They don't believe it. They will not oppose it openly. But then they, not, they are not going to mention it. There are some people that will never mention holiness or sanctification. They will not deny it outright, openly. But they are not going to mention it. They will be silent about it. And when you do it like that, you are taking it away. There are some people that will not mention the necessity of the power of the Holy Ghost in the life of the believer. When you don't mention it, you are taking it away. There are people that will not mention the, the things and the word of God that they feel, well, uh, I don't think I want to get into that area because I don't think I can do that myself. And they will cleverly keep quiet about that area. Now let me ask you. In the church here, if you don't hear a particular thing, a particular teaching of scripture, you don't hear it for one year. 
You don't hear it for two years. You don't hear it for five years. Although the preacher may not say, I disbelieve it. We cancel it. We remove it from the Bible. We don't want to believe that again. Although we don't say that, if we're quiet about it, and when anybody asks a question about it, oh, we just say, we have no time now to answer that question. Uh, we let's think of other practical things. When you keep quiet about it for such a long time, that people are going to forget. It is like you are taking it away. You are taking it away. And if you are doing that, you may do it cleverly. God knows you. And God knows your address. He knows what you are doing. He knows the kind of devilish cleverness you are trying to have. And it says, look at it in verse 19. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. You see, well, there may not be any, any church uh, man, uh, dignitary, that will be able to take you away from the church. Oh, you might say, I can do anything. I can believe anything. I just don't accept that word of God. I take that doctrine away from my understanding. And let me see that pastor that can take me out of the church. Well, the pastor may be so weak, he may not take you out of the church. The leader may be so weak, he does not take you out of the church. But you know what? The Lord Almighty himself, is he afraid of you? Is he afraid of anyone? God himself shall take away his part out of the book of life. Which one is more serious? You may not be taken away from the local church, from the visible church, from the big denomination. But then God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And then it says, out of the holy city. Out of the holy city. Out of the holy city. A person may still be an officer in the local church. In the visible church. But then God takes away his part out of the holy city. And from the things, from the rewards, and from the promises that are written in this book. That's why you see, my brothers and sisters, you need to be very, very careful. As you look at the word of God, so you do not become guilty of either adding to the word of God or taking away from the word of God. Our study today brings us some great things in scripture. That nominal worshippers will count as strange. Uh, many times uh, or a few times I've had the privilege of going to some places to preach. And when we declare the truth of the word of God as it is, some people will count it as strange. They will say, eh, can we do that? They will say, is there any grace for a believer to do that? They will look at it as so great and so strange. In Osea chapter 8 and verse 12. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 12. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Here was God telling Hosea, and he was telling him, you see, I have controversy with the children of Israel. Do you know what I've given to the children of Israel? Great, great, great things of my law. But then those children of Israel, they counted those things as a strange thing. I hope you are not like that. I pray you will not be like that in Jesus' name. Now, let us look at these things one by one. And as you hear these things, if you'll do them, remember the blessing that the Lord Jesus pronounced on the people that keep the word of God. He said, blessed are they, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Uh, we have divided this chapter, Exodus chapter 22, to three parts. And uh, part one is full restitution required from thieves and offenders. Let's now go back to Exodus chapter 22. From verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Let's stop there for a moment. Here he's talking about restoration of a sheep or oxen to the rightful owner by an individual who had stolen that ox or that sheep from the one that has it. I want to show you something to start with. That this is not the only place where such thing is mentioned in the Bible. In fact, you find in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, the teaching, the doctrine, the instruction concerning restitution. Let's look at a few. In Leviticus chapter 6, Leviticus chapter 6, I'm reading to you from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor, in that which was delivered to him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a sin, taken away by violence, or has deceived his neighbor, 
This is talking about an individual that will do wrong. This is talking about an individual sinning and committing iniquity before the Lord. It says in verse 3, or it is in the matter of something that he has found, that which was lost, or it li and lies concerning it, and sweareth falsely in any of all these that a man doeth sinning therein. Then it shall be, because he has sinned, and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he has deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. In verse 5, or all that about which he has sworn falsely. He shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fit part more thereto. And shall give it unto him to whom it appertaineth. He'll give it to the rightful owner in the day of his trespass offering. Notice that in the day of his trespass offering. That's telling us something. The time in the, among the children of Israel, in particular, when they will think about their restitution, is the time they were repenting. You see, as the word of God came to Moses, you know that in an earlier chapter that's referring to Exodus now, God had given him the commandments, the Ten Commandments in particular. And now he will not leave the interpretation or the application of that law to the imagination of the men of Israel, to the imagination or the interpretation of the children of Israel. He himself now will give some details to his own people that will help them in their obedience to the word of God. And these details were reading address the practical situations among the children of Israel. God held a constant lesson before those people. What's the lesson? The vast responsibility for the consequences of their conduct. They were told that they had to make restitution if they stole anything. Please remember that the children of Israel had been saved, they had been redeemed. But if any of them sinned, they had to be repentance before they could be forgiven. And to show that their repentance was practical, genuine, and thorough. That, that uh, repentance also had restitution with it. Restitution was a practical way of saying that they were really turning away from their sin. Are we still required to repent today? Repentance. Is this still necessary today before the sinner can be forgiven? Well, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we are told that even those of us who say we know the Lord, even those of us who say we are calling upon the name of the Lord, if we sin, there must be repentance. That's very important. And you need to notice that there are some people that are carrying about false doctrine. And they are saying that if you have been saved, once you are saved, we are forever saved. And therefore, after you are saved, even if you sin, necessity of repentance, they say, is no more there. Let's look at scripture in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, you notice that, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, and then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin, and will heal their land. You see that repentance was still necessary. And even if the person had never known the Lord, you've never been born again, but you, you want to come to know the Lord. You want to have reconciliation with God. You want to become a child of God. The step you'll take will be the step of repentance. In Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked forsake his way. There ought to be repentance. Repentance is that godly sorrow in the heart of the sinner that makes him to turn away from his wickedness, from his evil. And then the unrighteous man, let him turn from his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Well, that's Old Testament. I about in the New Testament. Are we required to repent in the New Testament? In Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. In fact, these were the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says now after that John was put in prison. 
Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Some people say what they are preaching is the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. And they say in the presentation of the gospel, there is no repentance. That's error. Look at verse 15. And saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Not just empty believism. Not just believe and accept. You must repent of sin. And then you will believe the gospel. In Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sin shall be preached in his name among all nations. In how many nations are we to preach repentance? Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So then you will see that repentance is so essential. And when Paul the Apostle went about preaching the gospel, what kind of gospel was he preaching? In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So then you will realize that repentance is very necessary. What if a person is a believer? And as a believer, he discovers that he's taking some wrong steps in his life. Listen to this now. As a believer, he sees that he has done wrong or he has gone back into sin. What is he expected to do? Let the lips of Jesus Christ form the words and give you the very words. The thing that a person who had been a disciple of Jesus, a believer in Christ, what he ought to do if that person goes back into sin. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Here Jesus Christ was talking, even to the man, to the person that he called the angel of the church at Ephesus. You see the position there? Even a person that had been in Christ a believer in the Lord, he had left his first love. What's he to do? In verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Here is the risen Christ. Here is a glorified Christ. Here is the one with majesty from the courts of heaven sounding forth into the earth below saying even this individual in the church that had seen that had left his first love there ought to be repentance. Which means then, if we really believe in the Lord and we are following his word, there ought to be repentance. What if there is no repentance? Look at that verse 5. Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. You must repent. You see, there must be repentance in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Hold fast and repent. Hold fast and repent. If there are areas in your own life where you know that you have gone astray and you have gone against the will and the word of God, even after you came to know the Lord, there ought to be repentance. But listen to this. Repentance to be genuine. Repentance to be thorough. Repentance to be practical. Must be accompanied with restitution. Man's sins against God are often sins against his fellow men also. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ does not cancel the responsibility of restitution before those offended. You need to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. The restitution we're talk talking about is restoring stolen things to the rightful owners. That is necessary in matters where they had been theft, in matters where they had been fraud, or dishonest gains, or unpaid bills slanderous report or false reports you see in all those areas there ought to be repentance as well as restitution if you are stolen money from your corporation you need to make restitution if you are stolen things from uh, the people of god to you you ought to make restitution you, you know there are times that uh, some people uh, they, they will have uh, you know the photographs of the pastor somewhere and then they will be made publish a particular magazine and then uh, it may be that there's somebody in the church and gives them you may be a full-time worker in the church 
and you have all the information in the church and you have all this information and then maybe you get money and then you sell out the information you have concerning the pastor concerning the church concerning everything and then we just see all these magazines outside and when you begin to read you begin to find photographs that you wonder when did these people outside the church when did they take those photographs i'm telling you that if you're like that and you are making money out of those photographs you know you are stealing you know that you are going astray and if you really want to know the lord you really want to make heaven at last you will need to make restitution you need to make right your way you see the people that are lying that are cheating the people that are committing wrong against their neighbors against their corporations against their companies the bible says that restitution has to be made not only in the area of a stolen property or stolen good in the area of stealing another man's wife or taking another woman's husband restitution has to be made look at this in genesis chapter 20 genesis chapter 20 let's look at it from verse 2 and abraham said of sarah his wife she is my sister and abimelech king of gera sent and took sarah i want you to realize it was a king here king of gera he sent and took sarah and God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. You see, it says here, uh, a king of Gera, Abimelech, you are a dead man. Because the woman that you have is uh, the wife of another man. And it is not right for you to take the woman, to take the wife of this other man and make her your wife. Therefore, restitution had to be made. You see, there are some people, they hear this word of restitution in the area of marriage. And they will say, well, if that is what they are teaching in the church, I think I will go to another church. And so they find another church, Pentecostal, Gospel, or Evangelical. And they say, nobody is going to bother me with restitution in this, my new church. But you are a dead man. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you are here or there. The word of God, it wasn't a denomination. It wasn't denominational doctrine that told Abimelech he was a dead man. It was Almighty God himself that told Abimelech, thou art but a dead man. Or other people will tell the woman, they will say, well, as long as we're here in this city, they'll be after us and telling us and make restitution, make right your way, and, uh, and I want to keep with you. I don't want you to ever leave me. And they go to another town. But the judgment of God is upon you. He pronounces you to be a dead man. Even if you flee to another town, other people will even run away to another country or go to another state. You see, even when you do that and you see that no preacher will be able to get at me anymore now, but God will get at you. Because it was God that told Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, uh, for she is a man's wife. What did the Lord tell the man to do? I want you to remember that God says, I am God, I change not. I want you to remember this was before the law of Moses. I want you to remember that if God is speaking today, this is what God is still saying. Look at it in verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife. Now therefore restore the man his wife. That's what the Lord is telling you, you man that has taken another man's wife, therefore they restore that man his wife. Or you woman that has taken another woman's husband, therefore restore the woman her husband. The Lord is calling upon you that you will need to make restitution. Now we are told that Abimelech obeyed the Lord. Look at verse 8. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning. And called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. And then eventually he did what he ought to do. He restored the wife unto Abraham. Because that is what the Lord told him to do. If he didn't do that, he would have been dead. The judgment of God would have come upon him. Look at verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. Restored him Sarah his wife. Now, do, do we have that same teaching in other parts of scripture? Oh yes, look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, here is Zacchaeus coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saw Jesus Christ 
face to face. You see that? Some people will say, I don't think I need to make restitution because of the encounter I had with the Lord. Do you have an encounter greater than that of Zacchaeus? Other people will say, I know how genuine my salvation is. I don't need any restitution. Is your salvation more genuine than that of Zacchaeus that got that salvation directly from the Lord? And the Lord pronounced him saved. Look at it. In Luke chapter 19 verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, they have of my goods I give unto the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Oh yes, some people will say Zacchaeus just said that, but the Lord was not teaching that. Zacchaeus just said that in his ignorance, that's what they say. In his foolishness, that's what they say. They said that the grace of God did not require that. Well, let's listen to the teaching of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee. That's that thing again, ought against thee, ought against thee. And I want you to remember that that word ought is one letter short of not. That means that it may be something next to nothing. It may be something that you say, well, I don't think that matters. But a brother has ought against you. But a sister has ought against you. Or it is your husband. He has ought against you. You say, well, I don't see anything to it. It's just a little thing. Well, it's next to nothing. And ought against thee. Or it is your wife. The way you are pressing, you are treating that woman. Uh, that woman is really crying every time. She is not a happy woman. She has ought against you. Or it, is your, or it is your own child, your own children. You are not treating them well. And they know what is right. They know how a daddy ought to behave. How a mommy ought to behave. And they have ought against you. It says here that if thy brother has ought against you, look at verse 24, leave there thy gift before the altar. You know, our sacrifices, our gifts will bring to the Lord. It may be you want to sing and you have a good voice, you are singing, but you know that your brother has ought against you. Not only that your ordinary, your normal, common brother has something against you, you know that the leadership in the church has ought against you. And you know that they have ought against you because you are really you are real concern and sorrow in the heart of the leadership in the church. And then you still go on singing. And you go on doing your normal work. You go on doing this and that as if you don't know that the church has ought against you. It says in verse 24, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. And first be reconciled with thy brother. There's nothing like reconciliation and fellowship. All our gifts. All our talent, all our service, all sacrifices, every other thing we do will not replace the need for fellowship. There is nothing like reconciliation and fellowship. Reconciliation between husband and wife. Reconciliation between parents and children. Reconciliation between brothers and sisters in the church. Reconciliation between workers in the church, between members in the church. Reconciliation between those who have voted against you and the people that you have offended. Nothing like reconciliation and fellowship. Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. You can offer the gift, but reconcile first. Make restitution first. Make right your way first. What's the conclusion of that thing? It's that you should have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Look at Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, reading to you there from verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always, always, a Paul the Apostle said always, when he was a young believer, when he was a growing believer, when he became a worker, when he became a leader, when he became an apostle, when he became a writer, when he became a missionary, in all those missionary journeys, he said, in everything I do, I never go beyond wanting to have a clear conscience. Always. Are you like that? Or do you know because of your position in the church, you can tread on people's toes, you can push them, you can pinch them, you can do anything you want, you can bully on them, and you never have any conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men. Is that your goal? Is that your desire? Do you really want to live a clean life? It says herein do I exercise myself to have always a, a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now that is the real teaching that we have in Exodus chapter 22. 
Exodus chapter 22, you might think that we are taking so much time on that. But you see all the rest I'm going to read to you now from Exodus chapter 22. These were just the details uh, for the children of Israel to tell them how to make the application of the restitution in their own peculiar lives. Now come to Exodus chapter 22 reading from verse 2. It says, now it's giving them the details of area they needed to make restitution. Exodus chapter 22, reading from verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. What that is saying is that if a man uh, was stealing and in the struggle with uh, the owners of the thing, he happened to die. They will not count it as murder. They will count it as that he had died for his sin. No blood will be shed for him. On the other hand, in verse 3, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, then uh, the person that uh, he had stolen him from cannot go and kill him, because then that will be the sin of murder. But what will happen? Look at verse 3. For he should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then it shall be sold for his stead. Do you see that restitution is so strong in the word of God that if the man that needs to make restitution has nothing to pay, he will be sold for his stead. He will be sold for his stead. That means that even if he has to sell his house to pay for restitution, he has to do it. Maybe you have stolen things before. Customs officer. Maybe you've stolen things before, civil servant. Maybe you, you've been in charge of a large amount of money and you know that you have really stolen. Now you are thinking of getting to the kingdom of God and you say, well, how can I make the restitution? I'll spend the money in building a house, sell the house and make restitution. I'll spend the money in building a car. In a, I'll spend the money in buying a car. Sell the car and make restitution. You see, with these children of Israel, if they are to be sold into slavery so that they will make restitution, they are to be sold and make restitution. Restitution was so serious and it is still so serious. Uh, whatever has to be sold, your clothing, your property, whatever, you have to sell whatever it is to make right your way and to make restitution. Look at uh, verse 5. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, or shall feed in another man's field, or the, of, the be, of the best of his own field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. You see that? If a person will allow his, um, another person's field to be broken through and to be, and to be spoiled by his own beast, by his own animal, then he will make restitution out of the best of his own field, out of the best of his own vineyard. Listen to this. You see, it may be that there is a man or a woman, and you will send your little girl to go and steal. That little girl may not know what she is doing. Or it may be you are a man, you send your little boy to go and steal. The little boy may not know what he's doing. But you know what the Bible is saying? You parents that are responsible for that, you have to make full restitution. Because you have taught your child, because you have taught somebody under your care to make her to do evil and to steal. And to bring the proceeds or to bring uh, the reward of that stealing into your own house to feed on it. In verse 6, if fire break out and catch in thorns. So that the stacks of corn, or the standing corn, or the field, be consumed therewith. He that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Do you see this? This was to discourage carelessness in the land of Israel. If by carelessness fire burnt the stacked grain in the field, the one who kindled the fire was required to pay in full. This penalty for carelessness taught the children of Israel to be careful of their neighbor's material and spiritual interests. And if it is wicked to set fire on corn, to set fire to corn, is it a light matter to set fire to sound doctrine, the life-giving bread of the soul? Can he be guiltless who takes away the bread of life from his neighbor, or burns down the altar, which is the stairway to heaven? He who sets fire... So the standing corn of righteous teaching is guilty before the Lord. Beware of burning down your neighbors, your brothers, your sisters' conviction by wicked suggestions. Now, I want you to look at the principle here in verse 6. That's, hey, don't be in a hurry. We need to really understand the word of God. You see here we are told that, uh, you know, these children of Israel, they were farmers. And as farmers, 
they were producing corn and producing grain that will be for the life of the nation. And if anybody out of wickedness will come and set fire on the food that ought to be eaten by the nation, then what will be done is that he'll make full restitution. But you know something? Sound doctrine, the word of God, the word of salvation, the word of righteousness is the bread of life. What if uh, you set that bread of life on fire? What if you take it away from your neighbor? What if by wicked suggestion you go to your neighbor and then uh, cleverly, wickedly, uh, you, are, you are eroding into the convictions of your brother, of your sister, so that the brother now has no convictions left because of your wicked suggestion? Oh, it's a great, great sin in the sight of the Lord. Now, because of that now, the people do not have the conviction of the holy standard of the word of God. Now, let's go to the next section, which is talking about controversial matters. This is talking about the fact that when there are matters that they couldn't deal with, then they will go to the judges, they will go to the people that knew the word of God, and these people will help them to understand the word. In verse 7, if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. Isn't that still restitution? Then it says, if the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he has put his hand unto his neighbor's goods for all manner of trespass whether it be ox for ass for sheep for raiment or for any manner of lost sin which another challenger to be his the cause of both parties shall come before the judges and whom the judges shall condemn shall find to be at fault he shall pay double unto his neighbor this is telling us that if it was a matter that they couldn't resolve on their own there were counselors there were judges. There were leaders. They will come before those leaders and then the leader will be able to tell who was in the wrong. And then the one that was wrong will pay double. That is, will make restitution. You see, all this is still talking about the fact that restitution is necessary. And as we go on through to verse 13, it's still talking about cases where restitution was necessary. Now come to verse 14. And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, out, out of his neighbor. That's the word again. Whatever it is. And if it be hot or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. That is, somebody has uh, lent you something. And then by carelessness, or maybe not by carelessness, you spent it. And then you come to say that, well, I can't see that thing again. The Bible says what you'll do is to make it good, just make restitution. But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good. He will not make restitution. If it be an higher thing, it came for his higher. Now what this is saying is that if the owner was with you when the thing was stolen, then the owner knew that it was not through your carelessness. The owner knew that it was not that you were, uh, you were injurious and you were a thief and you stole the thing. He will say, well, I, I saw it myself. I knew it myself. It was stolen. And then there will be no restitution in that case. Now let's come to verses 16 and 17. As we look at verses 16 and 17, our young men and women in particular should be very careful here. Because you need to have the proper, right understanding of the word of God. And you see, with some people, they do not understand the word of God. Therefore, they will read the word of God in isolation. And because they do not compare it with other parts of scripture, then they will, uh, they will distort that word and twist that word and rest that scripture to their own destruction. But look at verse 16, look at what he's saying. If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If a father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. What, what do we have in those two verses? Pay attention. You see, this is not talking about an Israelite with a lady of Moab. If that ever happened in Israel, that man of Israel will be stoned to death. 
This was not talking about a man in Israel going unto the Amorites. No, this is talking about an Israelite with an Israelite. You see, this is not talking about an equal you. This is not saying, well, you know, uh, I'm a Christian and already now I've uh, gone to the village and I've got uh, this woman. In fact, it was a temptation. And already now uh, I'm even told that uh, the woman uh, does not see the, uh, the thing anymore uh, because of that church. Consider me. After all, there is a passage in Exodus chapter 22. Let me marry her and let the church do the wedding for us. There's nothing like that. This is not talking about an Israelite with a non-Israelite. Now, look at verse 16. If a man entice a maid, it's talking about a man in Israel, a maid in Israel. A maid that is not betrothed, a maid that is not already in courtship with another man in Israel. And lie with her. Then he shall surely endow her to be his wife. What the word of God is saying here to the children of Israel is that a young man had gone to a young woman. And without their parents knowing anything, uh, the man deceived and lured and enticed the lady into an immoral act. And later turns around to say, well, uh, well, it was just a mistake. I don't have any intention of marrying her. It was uh, just the weakness of my flesh. I do not have any intention of marrying her. Because look at it. She is so ugly. How can I marry her? She is so Ill, she is such, uh, such an illiterate. How can I marry her? What they are saying here is that the penalty, which is a form of restitution here, the penalty and the punishment, the chastisement, is that that ugly lady, that illiterate lady, will be forced upon him so that he will marry her. That's what they are saying. Now in verse 17, if her father utterly refuse, there's a second side of the coin. If the father utterly refuse, this is not the father of the lady. The father of the lady looks at a young man and he sees that the young man that has enticed his own daughter is not uh, the kind of a man he'll want to give his daughter to. Therefore, he utterly refuses. He says, I have a big plan for my own daughter, a good plan for my daughter. And even though my daughter has gone into this mess, I, I will forgive my daughter and I'm not going to throw away my daughter to a, a, to a rascal, a useless man like this. He utterly refuses to let that daughter marry him. Well, the man just I say, well, that's all right then. I've done what I want to do. I've gone in into her. I've had a kind of knowledge of her. You don't want to give her unto me. That's all right. I go my way. Oh, no, it doesn't end that way. He will pay penalty. He will make what's the penalty? The penalty is restitution. Look at verse 17. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. That means uh, the father will say, If I were to give a uh, heart to you to marry the dowry of a spotless virgin that had not been defiled before, this is a large amount. Now you bring that amount, it is not for marriage, it is for penalty. It is for restitution. And so you will see that in the land of Israel, this is what they did so that they could keep the camp of the children of Israel pure. Now let's quickly go to point number two. This shouldn't take as much time as the rest of the chapter. In point number two, we have severe punishment for witches and idol worshippers. Let's look at it in Exodus chapter 22, verses 18 to 20. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That means thou shalt not allow, thou shalt not permit a witch to live. No, not in the land of Israel. And whosoever, verse 19, light with a beast shall surely be put to death. Verse 20, he that sacrifices unto any god, any idol, except save unto the Lord only, it shall utterly be destroyed. Now, here we find the severe punishment that came upon witches and upon idol worshippers. Witchcraft, immorality, and idol worship were severely punished in the Old Testament. Trafficking with the unseen world was viewed as diabolical and the serving of the dead penalty. It brought defilement and was regarded as a great iniquity that separated men, women, and children from God. And so God punished it severely. In fact, even the Canaanites, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 to 12, you will see that God punished even the Canaanites and destroyed them because of their involvement with witchcraft, enchantments, and sorcery. 
Now, what is to be our attitude today? Well, the attitude we have today is the same attitude that God has always heard. That we will have no fellowship with witches or wizards, with idol worshippers or the people that have, uh, that have any kind of immoral life. We have no association with them, no relationship with them. In the case of the children of Israel, Israel was commanded to deal with that sin severely. They were not to allow spiritism in any form in their midst. In fact, do you know that good kings in Israel, they rooted out the sodomites and witchcraft out of their kingdom. At the beginning of Saul's reign as king in Israel, he cut up those that had familiar spirits and the witch and the wizards out of the land. Of course, I'm sure you know his story. Later, in his backsliding condition, he sought help from a woman that had a familiar spirit. What happened to him? God slew him. God killed him and destroyed him because of that transgression. And this is what we're still told today in the word of God. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, reading from verse 6. And the soul that turneth unto such as have familiar spirits, utter wizards, to go a honoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul. And will cut off the from among will cut him off from among his people. Here God says, I'll set my face against such an individual, I'll cut him off, I'll remove him. You see, there are some churches today, it was surprising. They call them gospel churches, evangelical churches, Pentecostal churches, Orthodox churches, historic churches, long standing churches, whatever. And you know the nurse, the witches and the wizards. And they give accommodation. In fact, they accommodate very much. They give them all the liberty they want in their midst. The people have been sorcery. The people belonging to secret cult. They give them all the chance they want in those churches. But in a church that Jesus Christ is reigning, in a church that the word of God is central, the witches and the wizards should not even be allowed to stay there. If there is anyone in a church like this, that is confirmed to be a witch. I'm not talking of suspicion. I'm not talking of somebody saying, I had a dream, I saw uh, so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, I saw Mrs. So-and-so. I'm not talking of that. I'm not talking of suspicion. I'm talking about the people that are confirmed to be witches and wizards or to have familiar spirit. If there is anyone like that and he refuses to repent and he refuses to burn and destroy all the magical acts and the books and the things that he uses, such a person should get out of the church. There is no accommodation for such people in this church. No fellowship for such people in this church. Are we to be petting them, nursing them, nourishing them, developing them, encouraging them? Should we have them in the choir? Should we have them among the ushers? Should we have them leading us fellowship? Why? Should we have a witch, a wizard, a herbalist? Should we have somebody that is still having sorcery? Should we have such a fellow in the children's church teaching our children? In this church, should we allow? If this Bible is the word of God, and we know it's the word of God, and if this Bible is central in our fellowship, central in all our activities, should we allow a witch to be cooking for us in the kitchen at the retreat? Should we allow witch any liberty? A sorcerer, any liberty at all? No, we should not allow them. What does the Bible say in First Corinthians chapter five, verse thirteen? First Corinthians chapter five, verse thirteen, the latter part of verse thirteen. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That person will have to be sent out of the church. He cannot remain in the church. Now, if a person also is bringing in false doctrine, what are we to do? We do not have any kind of liberty, any kind of chance for them among the working force in the church. We do not even have any fellowship with them at all. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Don't befriend them, don't have fellowship with them. If they are evil, let us make sure that we set them apart. We, we send them out of the church if they are corrupting other people, destroying other people with their witchcraft, with their sorcery, with their false doctrine. We should take our stand with the word of God. We shouldn't allow a witch, an adulterer, an adulteress, a prostitute that refuses to repent, 
Habadi, so I don't worship her. We shouldn't uh, uh, allow such to be in the fellowship of the people of God in the church. Such must be removed from the fellowship of the children of God. And of course, such people, if they do not repent, they will be judged by God. Eternally, they will be separated from the congregation of the righteous. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers. You see that all the people that use familiar spirit and witchcraft and, and sorcery and all those things, and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, where will they be finally? They shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That brings us to the third point in our study today as we bring everything to a conclusion. In Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22, we're reading from verse 21. This is talking about the consecration and holiness that is expected from the people of God. Look at it from verse 21, Exodus 22. Thou shalt not vex a stranger, nor oppress him, that, uh, for, nor oppress him. for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. In verse 25, if thou lend unto any of my people that is poor by thee, Thou shalt not be to him as an usurer. Neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. That is uh, interest. That is so heavy upon them and already they are poor. In verse 26, if thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. That is uh, somebody owed a, an Israelite something. Another Israelite. And he went there to take something as a place. Saying, you must pay me. I've been, I've been asking of this for a long time. And then he takes anything. Then he realizes this fellow is poor. And in the cold night, he will not be allowed to just sleep without his coverlet. Without his wrapper. And therefore he must take it to her or to him immediately. In verse 27, for that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he cries unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. Here the Lord was talking about the care, the concern that the children of Israel are to have for strangers, for widows, for orphans. You see, they were not only to tolerate the poor, they were to give them care. And the widows and the orphans and the strangers and the needy people were to receive the fullest protection. Refugees, foreigners and the needy were to be well treated so that they will make them see the love of the God of Israel so that their souls may be saved. It means take care of the poor and then the Lord will take care of you. It means we are to be concerned for the spiritual welfare and the physical welfare of the need around us. And then we'll be able to hear these words from the Lord in the last day. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. This is teaching us that we really have to take care of the people around us. We really have to take care of the needy and the poor and the widows and the strangers all around us. It's a very great lesson. Look at James chapter 1 verse 27. James chapter 1 verse 27. It says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the fatherless is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted from the world. That's very, very important. To keep himself unspotted from the world. And that is a check. To make us understand we are to care for the needy. But let it be the needy that is not bringing worldliness into the church. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. 
We are to care for the widows, but let it be a widow that is not bringing fornication, adultery, immorality, pornography, evil into the church. Oh yes, we are to care for the widows, but I hope those widows realize that they should be in a holy condition. In a righteous condition. In fact, if you come back to Exodus chapter 22, you must remember that this section, verses 21 to 27, which we have read together, they follow very closely immediately after verses 18 to 20. What that means is that if a stranger was in Israel, and that stranger was a witch, that stranger was a wizard, oh no, they were not to give any accommodation to that stranger, a witch, a wizard, he will be stone dead. Not only that, if a widow in Israel was to receive any care at all, any concern at all, that widow in Israel will not be a witch. If that widow in Israel was a witch, she would not be given any care at all. In fact, there will be chastisement and punishment. If that widow was uh, having immorality, of course, she will not be taken care of. She will be killed. She will be destroyed. If she was worshipping idols, sacrificing to any god, any idol and not the Lord, she will be destroyed from among the people. This is telling you something, that we have to be balanced in the word of God. When we say we are to take care of widows, it doesn't mean that the coordinator will be going to that widow and petting that widow and uh, touching that widow and saying, I'm trying to take care of her. No, that's immorality. That's immorality. That's not taking care. That widow would even be killed and destroyed from among the people of God. If, uh, uh, let's say somebody says, uh, well, she is a stranger and she comes to this city. And then as a stranger, she is uh, practicing a uh, prostitution. And then somebody will say, you know, the Bible says we are to take care of strangers. Not that kind. Not that kind. Not the, not the strangers that are prostitutes. Those strangers will not be allowed to stay among the people of God in the land of Israel to pollute, to destroy, to corrupt the children of Israel. Well, is the New Testament different? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, reading to you from verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lost strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. You see, the widows were to take care of in the church here, we are told. They are not the widows that will say, well, since I lost my husband, I won't work for God again. Since I lost my husband, I won't be able to serve the Lord again. These are the people that are giving all their effort into the service of the Lord. These are people, it says from verse 9, they have been the wife, she has been the wife of one man. Not only that, well reported of for good works. Always full of good works like dockers. Maybe sewing something to that other fellow, giving sweater to that one, giving blanket to that one, helping that one. And she's well reported all for good works. Those are the widows. We know that they are real widows indeed. And we're taking care of them and we should be taking care of them. It says in verse 10, if she has brought up children, she brings up her children in the way of the Lord. She brings up her children in the nurture, the admonition, the teaching of the word of God. Not the widow that is too much concerned about money, about uh, friends, about uh, popularity, about other things. And her children are neglected. Not the widow that is uh, stuffing her children with worldliness and with things that are evil. She is uh, teaching her children the way of holiness. Those are the widows who are to reckon with in the church. Look at it in verse 10. She has lost strangers. She is available in the church. And if we say, well, this person uh, has a need and you have accommodation. Oh, she says, uh, let her come. I can do that on behalf of the church. That is my ministry in the church. Those are the widows we are talking about. If she has what the saints feed, she's always relieving the saints of God. She is a saint herself. These are the widows that the church is to reckon with. Not only that, if she has relieved the afflicted. She has relieved the afflicted. She is in the health fellowship system. Either teaching house fellowship. Taking care of those who are needing in the house fellowship herself. Or she's maybe uh, an area leader, a woman representative, a woman coordinator. And she's involved in taking care of the others. And she has diligently, wholeheartedly, seriously and fervently followed every good work. These are the widows that the New Testament says, Church, if you have any widow among you that are noted for righteousness and holiness, not the witches. 
if a, if a widow will say, well, after all, the Bible says you should take care of me, although I am a witch, why don't you take care of oh, we say no, that the witch is still to be disciplined. It doesn't matter your physical condition, if you are a sinner, if you are a backslider, that you are a widow, that you are an orphan, will not mean that we are going to relegate the word of God to the background and just be taking care of you without you standing upon the totality of the word of God. Look at verse 11. But the younger widows refuse. Timothy, you don't have experience, but here is what I'm telling you. Young minister, you don't have experience. Here is what I'm telling you. The younger widows refuse. Why? For they will, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. You see, some of those uh, widows uh, within the church uh, at the time of Timothy, they now began to wax wanton against Christ, accusing Christ and questioning Christ. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? And they began to practice things not according to the word of God, having damnation because they have cast off their false faith. You see, those widows, uh, they, cast, they cast off their false faith. Casting off their false faith, they were not as zealous again, as loving again, as devoted again, they were not as giving to the word of God again. Not only that, in verse 13, with that, they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busy bodies speaking things they ought not to. You see, these, were, these widows, they will be speaking even against the leadership in the church. They will be speaking against the dignitaries. They will be speaking against uh, the doctrines of the word of God. They begin to find fault. And the people that go to visit them, instead of they, instead of those people encouraging those widows, the widows will be planting confusion and corruption in their mind. Oh, he said, Timothy, you don't give any chance to any kind of widow like that. Then in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully look at this in verse 15 for some already turned aside after satan so you see we need to balance up the word of god oh yes we take care of the people that are needy if those needy people themselves they are yielded to the word of god they are yielded to correction and they say oh lord i see i've gone wrong i see that i've done what i shouldn't have done help me so that i'll be able to live right now come to exodus chapter 22 verse 29 exodus 22 the first part of verse 29 thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits. Then in verse 30 it says, Likewise shalt thou do with thine oxen and with thy sheep seven days. It shall be with a dam. And then on the eighth day thou shalt give each unto me. Here the Lord was telling the children of Israel that they are to put God forth. And God is still demanding the first ripe fruits of our education, of our toil, of our experience, and of all that we have. God is asking for the first ripe fruit of our education in the use of our intelligence for the glory of God in the service of the Lord. He wants us to give whatever we have unto him. It may be money or talent or time or resources. Even our children, we ought to give our children to the Lord for his service. Do you pay your tithe? Do you give a tenth of your income unto the Lord? Above all, we are to make sure that we give our hearts and life wholly unto the Lord. The conclusion is in verse 31. The first part of verse 31 says, And ye shall be holy men unto me. And ye shall be holy men unto me. The Lord is calling us to holiness. He doesn't want uncleanness in our lives. He doesn't want any evil to touch us. He doesn't want any immorality in our midst. He wants us to really have, He wants us to have holiness completely in our lives. Well, as you look at what the Lord has taught us today, hasn't he revealed some great, great, great things to us today? I told you at the beginning, there are some people that are denying the word of God. And I thank God that you are not one of those people. I believe you are one of the people that will say, Oh Lord, I've heard your word, I've heard your word. I want to follow after your word. Remember, you are not to add to the word. You are not to take away from the word. Before we pray, let me give you this verse. In Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34, in verse 32, That which I see not teach thou me, 
If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Isn't that your language? The Lord has revealed such wonderful things, great things to you today. He has revealed the depth of his knowledge and is calling you to holiness and righteousness in your life. He told us of genuine repentance. He told us of how to make that repentance practical and make restitution where necessary. He calls us to a life of righteousness, consecration and holiness unto the Lord. I believe you want to rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That which I see not teach thou me. And if I have done iniquity, O Lord, help me by your grace, I will do no more. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't get offended at the word of God. Don't get offended at the teaching of the word of God. Be a child of God. And you tell the Lord, O Lord, I've been careless in my life. I've neglected many things. And I've done things I shouldn't have done. Oh Lord, look at me. Have mercy upon me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. If there's any way you have been careless, just come to the Lord and say, Oh Lord, have mercy upon me and help me so that I can stand firm in the word of God. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Come to the Lord and He's able by His grace to cleanse you, to wash you, and to make you as holy as you ought to be.